Good afternoon. My name is Ben. Uh, I'm here today to talk about intraoral welding, whether we should weld or shouldn't weld. Uh, I'd like to thank FMC and Chris Bartlett from Quantage uh, for asking me along uh, to present today. Uh, as some of you might know or might not know, uh, Ontogy, which is the company that I use, was recently acquired by, by Strauman. Uh, now some of the members of staff were happy with that move to Strauman, others less so. This is George, our new head of sales. <laughs> He's really happy about the changes ongoing at Strauman. Ingrid and Hector we're less happy. So, today we're going to, oh sorry, hello there. Are you Eddie? I'm Eddie. Sorry, well somebody done. told me to start. Apologies. Okay. Did you want to? Please do, no, I was going to introduce you. You missed my jokes. I'd love you to go for it. <laughs> okay. So today's presentation, I'm going to talk about Axiom implants, which is the implant system that I use within my practice. Uh, talk about intraoral welding, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of welding, and then we'll go through a couple of cases to show one that we do use welding on and another one we don't use and the differences between the two cases. So in my practice, I currently use two implant systems. I use Axiom implants made by Ontogy, and I also use Ankylos. So today we're going to talk a bit about uh, Axiom implants. They're made by a company called Ontogir. They've been making implants for about 70 years. Uh, and about 30 years ago, they started making their own implants. So they used to make implants for other companies. Now, um, they now make their own implants. And they have two main types of implants. They have the regular profile, which is this one on the left-hand side, which is like a parallel implant with a self-tapping thread. And they also have the PX implant, which is the one on the right, which has a self-cutting thread and a much more aggressive thread. So that's designed for immediate extraction sites, uh, not such dense bone. Within my practice, however, I pretty much exclusively use the PX implant, mainly because uh, it means we only have to have one set of implants, we don't have to carry two sets of stock. And it's unusual to want less primary stability. So the only instance where you might struggle with the PX because it's got such an aggressive thread is in dense bone, so lower anterior mandible. But we can adjust our, our protocol there so we can still use the PX there. So it allows us to, to use just a single implant rather than having to carry two uh, different types of implants. Alongside that, pointer, uh, we have a bone level and a tissue level. So the bone level is the one on the left, and it's like a conventional implant, a two-piece implant. But they also have a tissue level, which is the one on the right, which is a one-piece implant with a transmucosal attachment. So the bone level is more like a conventional implant. It's a two-piece implant, you've got the, the implant itself, uh, and then the abutment that connects to it. has some, several very excellent properties. It's got a conical connection, it's got platform switching. Um, it's very similar in, in Ankylos in that we place it subcrestal, sub and it's got a full digital connectivity as well. Alongside that, we also have the tissue level implant. Now a tissue level implant is a one piece implant. So rather than having a separate uh, abutment, it's a single piece. The advantage with that is we have no connection at the bone level. It's all made in one piece of titanium. It comes in lots of different sizes, lots of different platforms. Uh, now when I moved to uh, Altagir about two years ago, coming from Ankylos, which is a more conventional two-piece implant, I thought I'd be placing majority of bone level implants. But actually, as I've moved on to here, I'm finding that I'm placing a lot more tissue level implants than bone level implants. The healing's really nice, they work brilliantly. Um, I'm very happy with them. 
Alongside that, we also have a full digital workflow. So we've got cement retaining crown, full zirconia crowns, full arched zirconia bridges, frame bridges. So we can provide a full uh, co coverage with the full restorative solutions for every single patient. When we move to multi-unit restorations, Actium has got an excellent connection called the uh, Inlink connection, which allows us to use it in a multi-level situation. So we can convert a bone level to a tissue level using our Inlink connection here. So it becomes exactly the same as a tissue level implant. But the big advantage with this system is, that, is the lab lock. This is the, the screw that holds the prosthesis in place. So rather than having a screw that goes through the prosthesis, it comes up from the apical position into the prosthesis. So it doesn't have to go through the, the restoration. Excuse me. The advantage with that is that we only have to have a very small access hole in our restoration. Whereas if we have an angled screw axis, the hole has to be much bigger. It doesn't look very nice on our final restoration. Here, we only have to have a small, small hole that our driver has to pass through. So it's just a two millimeter hole the driver passes through, uh, connecting this screw into the implant. So it comes in from this direction rather than in from the occlusal. So it also means we're not going to drop any screws in a patient's mouth. So this is a case uh, of intraoral welding using axin implants. So as some of you may or may know, it was introduced by Marco De Gedi in Bologna in Italy. Uh, he originally used it on the an uh, ankylos implant system. What it allow, it uses the technique of spot welding to allow us to construct a titanium framework on the day of surgery. So we use our spot welder and some specially designed temporary buttons to weld a two millimeter wire to the implant structure. So we, we bend our wire into shape we then spot weld that to our temporary abutments and then we and then encase that in our temporary bridge. So advantages. It means we can do the surgery and we can place the final rest or the temporary restoration, sorry, on the same day of surgery. Uh, it reduces the risk of fracture. So because we've got our titanium bar there, it strengthens the prosthesis and it also splints the implants together, making them a nice rigid structure. So who can we help? George maybe, this is George in his summer outfit. And this is, this is Barry. So Barry was unhappy with the appearance of his upper teeth and wanted to do something about it. Didn't want to have a denture, didn't want bridge work. He knew he wanted teeth in a day. So this is the CT scan. So on the day, remove the teeth, we place our six implants in this case. So here was a combination of tissue level and bone level. So anteriorly we tended to put tissue level and posteriorly, sorry, anteriorly tend to put bone level and posteriorly we tend to put tissue level. We then put our temporary cylinders onto those implants. Now these come in different angulations, 0, 10, 15, and 25. We put them into place. We then take our two, uh, two millimeter titanium wire and we bend that into shape. So usually the technician will bend that into shape for me. And then we spot that to each of the cylinders. And that provides a very solid connection. So it provides a framework for our temporary bridge. That's then spot welded in place and you wouldn't be able to remove them or break them from the titanium wire. We then put that back into the patient's mouth. Check that it fits within our shell that we've had pre-made prior to the surgery. So we've taken study models, done a diagnostic wax up and got what we call a white shell made. So that fits within our shell. We then opaque the titanium framework and then when we've got axiom we have what's called a lab lock these are little push buttons 
or push threads that are designed for the technician in the lab so they can take the restoration very easily on and off the model without having to screw it into place. The advantage here is we can take our framework, we can click it up into place, and then we can then put our cue resin around and remove it without having to have any screws that impacts on our occlusion so the patient can bite directly onto the temperature and know it's seated correctly. So this is our framework clipped into place. We then syringe our cue resin round and then seat our shell over the top of that. That then sets and we can remove that from the patient's mouth. We then have a technician on site who will then finish that restoration, polish it up, make it look nice. So this is it finished and polished. Please all surface. Uh, fit surface, sorry. And that's it then fitted into the patient's mouth. Giving us an immediate, very strong temporary restoration. We then leave that in place for about three months or so. We get the patient back to make the final restoration. So we then go through the process of making the final restoration. So this is it, three months post implant placement. Pretty good soft tissue healing, couple of little areas where it's you know, a little bit inflamed, but generally pretty good. So we do our conventional impressions, bite registration. And in this case, we went for a framework with individual milled crowns. So this is our try-in. So we've had our framework made. We can then try that in the patient's mouth, check that they're happy with the appearance, check that the bite's good make sure the patient's happy. He wasn't happy with showing metal, so we decided to put some pink on there for him. And this is our final restoration. So rather than having a restoration that has screw access holes where each of our implants is, we have individual crowns that are cemented onto the framework. So where we haven't got any access holes, the technician will cement that in place for us. Excuse me where we need to access our screw access holes, the crowns are left off. So it comes back to us with crowns off. We can then put that in the patient's mouth. We can screw it down into position and then we, we can then cement the crowns on top of the access hole. <coughs> That's our final bridge. So the big advantage for the patient is that we've got no screw access holes, okay? So it comes back, we screw it in place, and then we cement each tooth onto the uh, bridge work. Uh, so it gives us a very nice cosmetic outcome. We've got no, no screw access holes. If a patient were to break or chip a bit of porcelain, all we have to do is remove the crown that's broken. These are milled Emacs crowns, so we just phone up the lab, say the patient's broken, upright six, they can mill a new crown, send it back to us, and we can put a new crown in place for you. You haven't got to take the whole restoration out, send it back to the lab, get it repaired. So it reduces those risks to the patient long term. So it's minimizing our risk as a dentist as well. So if anything breaks or what happens to it, we can sort it easily. We, if we have a crown come off, we can also take a conventional impression. We can cut the crown off, take a conventional impression, and the technician can just make it like a new crown. Very simple, very easy. We've still got retrievability. So we, we, where it's covering the access holes, we just stick it in with a temporary cement. It does allow us to then remove the, that crown, take the bridge off if we want to, put it back into place again. So it's giving us retrievability, good cosmetic outcome, the patient's happy, and I'm happy, because I'm not worried they're gonna break a bit of porcelain and I'm gonna have to remake their bridge for them. Uh, before and after. So that's a case we did using the welding technique. This is another case. This is a patient who was unhappy with their lower teeth, periodontally involved, mobile, anteriors, wanted some new teeth. Put her through some perio, CT scan. This time we didn't do welding, so this is 
showing the differences between the two techniques. So again, we extract the patient's teeth. We put our four implants in place. Here, we're just using all tissue level. As I've got more confident with the Axiom implant systems, I tend to use a lot more tissue level implants than I used to. Uh, the reason initially was if you use a bone level and you put your in-link abutment in to convert it to a tissue level and you get a bit of soft tissue healing and you can see the abutment, you can change that and you can put a shorter one in or a longer one in if you need to. After a couple of years, you're seeing really lovely healing. I'm confident that the tissue is going to be stable and so I tend to, uh, certainly on the lower, use more tissue level. So you've got no connection there at all. So here's four tissue level implants in place, suture closed. We then again put our temporary uh, abutments in place, temporary copings, they're screwed onto each implant. We then take our white shell, this is where it changes a little bit. Rather than uh, creating a metal framework, here we're just going to pick it up in acrylic. So we have to have the, the uh, temporary copings through our occlusal surface of our shell. So just making sure we can seat our shell, the patient can bite together. We then take our Q resin, we syringe that around the temporary abutments, making sure we put some wax in the holes so we don't fill up the holes. Put it into our shell and then seat that in the patient's mouth. So seat it in place, patient bites together so we know it's in the correct position. You let it all set, that's then unscrewed, goes to the technician, and he finishes it all. So, looks a bit messy at the moment. If I go and have a cup of tea, Pierre yeah, finishes it nicely for me. So it's finished off, screw down into place, patient's happy. Unfortunately, we haven't got our framework and just as she was coming in to have her final restoration done, the distal of the lower left sectus fractured. It's not the end of the world, but it does happen. Uh, probably should have not put a cantilever on. So on that lower left six, probably should have left that off and maybe perhaps put the cantilever on the final restoration. So it's just snapped distal to here, uh, which is, we can deal with. If we had a, a titanium framework there, perhaps that wouldn't have happened. Any questions? Any questions? Lots. When you do the pickup, do you don't put anything to protect the stitches? It depends, really. Um, if, if, if it's all nice and tight, then no. If I've got edentulous areas, sorry, no, where I've taken the tooth out, and you can see the socket, then I might pack some PTFE into the socket to prevent the Q resin going into it. Occasionally you'll take it out and you can feel it catch on a suture, in which case you just cut it, put a new suture in there. So it's more, I'm, I'm not so worried about picking up a suture, I'm more worried about the Q resin going down into an extraction site. And obviously if you don't spot that, that's it's not a good socket preservation material, I don't think, as far as I know. Sorry, is there another question? Any other questions? Right. Ben, thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, hang on, we've got one more question. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to do some hygiene therapy? Yeah. How do you get to there? Sorry, you can't see the screw. On the final restoration. Hygiene uh, therapy. Yeah. Yeah, immediately post off. No, no, after Once everything's healed and they're on their routine recall. Yeah. yeah. As in, can't see the screws. If you want to take the restoration off to do the cleaning. Oh, we see what you mean. Well, you can still do that. We don't routinely do that. So you can still remove it. You could, you could take the crowns off. It's a bit of a faff. You would have to take the crowns off, remove the bridge, and then put it all back together again. But we, you know, they, they, sh they should be able to access it to be able to clean it without having to remove it. Yeah. I mean, you can obviously remove it, but it's a, it's a bit of a faff, to be honest. How do you take off the crowns? How do you take off the 
Uh, Repeat the question. How, how do I take off the crowns? Crown and bridge remover. Bang, bang, bang. Yeah. In most cases, I, the reason the crown off is off is either the temporary <laughs> cement's gone or they've broken it. So it's not that common that we have to physically remove a crown that's actually intact and in place of cement because usually you're removing the crown because either they've broken something or, or um, uh, what was it? or it's come on, it's de-cemented. So occasionally you get a patient just continually knocking <laughs> off, in which case I might cement it back in with a permanent restoration. If the cement comes off, yeah. you're right, it's easy to take it off. It is. If you, want to if you need to take it off, it's less hard, it's, it's not so easy. Yeah, uh, you can and you can damage it. Like I said, we don't... The doesn't come off? Not always, no. no. Yeah, but no the other thing you need to do is take a photo of it so you know which crowns you need to remove to remove the restoration because if you don't do that you have to take every single crown off to know where your screw access holes are so it's important to take a photo so you know which crowns you need to remove right then thank you very much no problem, really really interesting thank you, thank you. Thank you.